Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 24 of the Healthy Gut Podcast, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Jason Horolak who is a naturopath, a herbalist, and a nutritionist with over 16 years of clinical experience. He currently teaches the Evidence-Based Complementary Medicine Program in the School of Medicine at the University of Tasmania and is the Gastrointestinal Imbalances Lecturer in the Master of Science in Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine Program at the University of Western States in Portland, Oregon. Jason did his honours, first class, and PhD degree in the areas of gastrointestinal microbiota, irritable bowel syndrome, and the clinical applications of pre- and probiotics. He has written extensively in Australian and international textbooks and journals on these topics. And today we talk all about the gut microbiome and the microbiota, and why it's so important for us to have diversity and health in our little bacteria that are living with inside of us. We also talk a lot about pre and probiotics because they're often a a thing that many people want to know more about when it comes to understanding whether they're right for use in treatment for their own SIBO. So I hope you enjoy today's episode 24 with Dr. Jason Horolek. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jason Horolek. It is absolutely wonderful to have you here today. Ah, thanks, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be on. Um, I'm looking forward to it, actually. Yeah, and my listeners are so excited to have you coming on to the Healthy Gut Podcast today because we're going to be talking about everything to do with pre and probiotics and SIBO and the microbiome. So and it's a, it's particularly a topic of great interest for myself um, personally and, and it definitely is with my listeners as well. And what I'd love for us to start with is for you to tell a little bit about your story, how you came to, to be who you are today and, and have such an interest yourself in um, the microbiome of the gut and also um, pre and probiotics. Well, I, I can start with where I'm at now. I'm, I'm a I'm, I've got a couple of different hats that I wear, I suppose. I, I'm a practitioner, so I'm a naturopath and nutritionist that, that's that been in practice for, for 17 years. Um, and my other hat is as, as an academic. Um, so I, le- I lecture at the University of Tasmania and also at the University of Western States. Um, and I try to, each week will be a balance of those different hats on different days. And I suppose my, my journey started when I was a nat- naturopathic student. And it was in the final year of my um, naturopathic training that there was a lecture by one of um, the staff members, Dr. Stephen Myers, who introduced this idea of dysbiosis from a natural pet medicine perspective, you know, the importance of the gut microbiota. And, and, and this is back in 1999. So, you know, it was, it was very early days yet, but it was certainly looking at, at the, the ideas that naturopathic physicians had around the importance of the gut ecosystem and, and what we were doing to it <laughs> potentially inadvertently with, with dietary um, and pharmaceutical interventions, for example. And his lecture got me amazingly inspired and excited. Um, so I approached him immediately afterwards and said, hey, um, you know, I'm about to finish. Can I do postgrad studies in this, this area? Um, so I, so I, and he said, yeah, sure, that sounds great. So then we moved on to do my honors degree and then my, subsequently my PhD um, in the early 2000s. Some honors started in 2000s, which was 17 years ago, which makes me feel a little bit old now. Uh, um, and it was Essentially, we were trying to find a condition that had dysbiosis as an associated or, or as, a, as, a, as a causative um, or where dysbiosis played, played a causative role and irritable bowel syndrome sort of fit that that bill. So we said, OK, well, let's see what we can do looking at the microbiota and although it was called the microflora back then and in irritable bowel syndrome and, and looking at, at how imbalanced it was and then looking at tools that could um, readjust that balance. So we started investigating or I started investigating probiotics and prebiotics, which are something that I was not really familiar with or, or only um, on a very surface level from my naturopathic training at that point in time, and also herbal medicine stack that we could use to alter that ecosystem in, in, in different ways to help it rebalance. So that was sort of the 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 goal of our of our research was seeing how we could we could use those tools and, and reviewing the research around all those tools and how they can modify the microbiota, specifically in gut conditions like IBS. Mm, and um, 
I think the world is a, is a, is very grateful for the fact that you uh, had such a great interest in it and and the work that you do today. And, and what I think would be great for us to start, and literally starting at the start, is if you can give the listeners a bit of an overview of what the uh, why we need to have this diversity of bacteria living in our digestive system, what it's there for, um, and what dysbiosis actually is. I know when I first got diagnosed with SIBO, I was hearing this term and I thought, I have no idea what that actually means. So if you can also explain what dysbiosis means in, a, in a simple terms. Yeah, dysbiosis, I think, in, in simple terms, would be just an imbalance of bacterial and bacteria, and, and what primarily bacteria, but it could be other microorganisms within the, an ecosystem. So um, that could be the wrong ones growing at the wrong spot, um, or the you know, too many of different of, of particular species growing at the wrong spot, or an imbalance of of of, of species. So you'll have too much of one, or two, or two, and too few of the other. Would be probably very simple simple ways of describing that. And we're now tying dysbiosis. In with a whole range of conditions that are well beyond what I originally envisioned when I started in this area back in 2000. You know, um, we were looking at gut conditions almost exclusively. You know, so inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome. That was most of what the research was done on in terms of dysbiosis. Whereas now we're linking in with type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome and obesity, um, depression, anxiety, autism. Um, as well as 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 gut conditions, the ones that I mentioned before, but also diverticular disease and chemotherapy and radiotherapy induced diarrhea. There's a whole bunch of things now that are being tied in with with dysbiosis, and I suppose in some respects the the pattern of dysbiosis is different um, between those different disease states, and perhaps on an on an individual level within patients with with those disease states, but you tend to see sort of patterns um, that occur within specific disease types. And can the dysbiosis occur at any point? in the GI tract, or is it just small intestine or just large intestine? Where does it occur? Well, I mean, arguably, you could you could say that, you know, if anywhere from, from mouth to, to anus, there could be dysbiosis, and we tend to consider the oral microbiome as, as being a bit a little bit different than than gut, and mostly, I suppose, because dentists tend to deal with, with mouth and teeth stuff and other sort of dental health professionals. Um, so we haven't looked at that so much in, in the, the context of, of gut dysbiosis, but there, there would be dysbiosis in, in the oral microbiome too that, that precludes to gum disease and uh, d- dental caries, for example. Um, and dysbiosis in the stomach, you know, you would be really essentially is a bug like Helicobacter pylori, which one could argue is the only sort of indigenous microbe that can can happily withstand living in our in our stomach. It's really when we get to the small bowel and, and large bowel that you start having a lot more microbes um, that that are naturally there. Um, but then there's still that that spectrum between the beginning bit of the small bowel where you have, you know, ten to the three, ten to the four bugs per per mill of contents versus the, the beginning of the colon where it's ten to the eleven. So it's far far more densely um, packed with microbes when you get to the colon, whereas the, the first bit of the small bowel is there's supposed to be very little bacterial activity in that section, not none, but but a lot less than anywhere you know anywhere else along the small bowel. And given that so many of my listeners um, have had SIBO or are currently dealing with SIBO, they, they're very well versed in, in what SIBO is and, and um, what it does to them. But some of these other conditions uh, that are related to dysbiosis, such as type 2 diabetes or um, anxiety, depression, do you find that the dysbiosis is occurring in the small intestine or the large intestine is there? Do you find that the link is that it's coming from one place, or is it that it could be that you've got dysbiosis across both your small and large bowel, um, and then that's causing one of these conditions to occur? It's a it's a good question, and I'd I'd say that essentially we're still learning, and there's still this is an area of new research, and it's booming area of research. So it means that there's new stuff coming out all the time. So there's certainly been some linkages between SIBO and anxiety and depression, and there's there's linkages between um, chronic dysbiosis and anxiety and depression. Just to give you an idea, certainly when it comes to obesity, metabolic syndrome. Um, Type two diabetes, we're probably thinking more of the colonic ecosystem, but that's not to say that 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 small bowel ecosystem is not playing some sort of role in that too. And and perhaps we're waiting more research to tease out some of those things. And it might be partly with with different patients that that might be playing a more indicative role for that scenario. 
And I think it's really exciting, the research that's coming out and the research that will be done in the future around uh, this um, area of our bodies. And, I, and I'm, I can't wait to see what we learn in the, in the coming years around this and how much that impacts our, the way we handle our health care. Yeah, very, very much so. And it's been amazing being in, in, in this world since 2000, essentially, to start seeing, you know, 2000, I could read every paper published in the microbiota that year. <laughs> and for the first subsequent years after that, I could I keep up easily. Whereas now the, the area is just booming. Um, and, and it's and it, it's an exciting bit, but also as a, as a, as a clinician slash researcher, it's not necessarily as easy to keep up your head in, in up to date um, as it, what once, it once was because there's just so much research that's coming on. And that but I think one of the biggest shifts that's occurred is perhaps an appreciation for the importance of the microbiota. Um, you know, when I go back to 2000, it was only the rare um, microbiota head, I'd say, as a least, um, term for someone who was very passionate with the microbiota, who who saw that it was important and that we should be careful about using antibiotics and, and um, et cetera, agents that could cause damage to the ecosystem, that there would be complications to that. You know, whereas now, I think that idea of um, the importance of the microbiota has really seeped through to the general public a lot more so and to a greater percentage of health professionals. Sadly, not all of them, in my opinion, not enough of them, but but more of them. So there's there's greater awareness, you know, and I think it goes back and perhaps I'll, um, well, I think of it because you asked before, but, you know, what does that, that our microbiota do for us? And I think this is probably a time, a good link in with that, um, you know, because we know that it's important for proper immune system function that you know, a, a balanced um, gut ecosystem can do two things. One, it tends to ramp up the arm of the immune system that protects us against infectious agents. But secondly, it, it sort of down regulates that arm that overreacts to two things such as um, environmental allergens like peanuts <laughs> you know, or dust that we really shouldn't be overreacting to. But, but many of us overreact to that. And we know now that that capacity of overreaction um, has to do with how the microbiota relates to your immune system in your, your early childhood years, which which um, is harder to shift, sadly, once you're you're outside those early childhood years. Um, you know, normal gut motility is related to, the, to the, the microbiota organ as well, or what I call the microbiota organ. And you, they've done lots of funky experiments back in the 60s and 70s where they managed to you know, eradicate the microbiota of, of mice and rats and just observe what would happen. Um, and Certainly one thing that happened was gut motility slowed down pretty dramatically, um, as well as immune system function decreasing dramatically too, to give you an idea. You know, the microbiota improves our nutritional status by, by increasing our, our um, production of B vitamins. You know, folate vitamins B1, 2, 3, 5, 6 are all produced in, in significant amounts by your, by your microbiota and, and absorbed. And we also produce a bit of B12, but sadly at a, at a point that's essentially beyond um, – or absorption, unless you've got SIBO, in which case you can absorb some of that B12. Um, but there's obviously trade-offs <laughs> that you get with that a bit of extra B12. Um, you know, vitamin K, also important. And also just even your energy, your daily energy needs are met by your microbiota. And even Westerners will make 10% of their, their daily energy needs are met by by colonic fermentation. Um, and, and that goes up as a fiber content of your diet goes up too. What are some of the signs, uh, and I, I must admit, I don't think I hear from many people that have a healthy <laughs> microbiome living in their system because they're generally they're people that have SIBO, so they're normally experiencing all sorts of symptoms. But what would a healthy individual look like? What are what's their life like? Oh gosh. <laughs> well, I think because of the fact we're, we're connecting that microbiota, the healthy microbiota with 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 healthy everything else, and that I think that area of research is just building and building. Um, that you would argue that they'd be. That's right. What's the right word of describing it? But in the in the right zone metabolically, so they're not no, no issues with blood sugar regulation, no issues with with weight gain, for example. Um, that their mood would generally be be in a healthy state. So they'd be less less perturbed by by stresses, for example. Um, I think those would be some of the key things that you'd see, as well as the lack of of autoimmune disease, the lack of gut symptoms. You know that that you should be able to eat you know a big pile of of um, let's just say legumes for the sake of argument, and you just have more flatulence. <laughs> that would be the the normal outcome, the ideal outcome when things are 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 in balance. But but when it, things are not in balance, then you can get you know bloating, distension, cramping, pain, diarrhea, or other symptoms that can go with with some of those things. So so it's with lack of food reactions, lack of um, allergic reactions would be signs of a, a healthy 
gut ecosystem and and even a healthier gut ecosystem in those early years because i think that seems to be what the research is pointing out is that disruption to that early colonization um process or that early immune system microbiote interaction seems to have lifelong effects in terms of allergic diseases the, the epidemic that we see of allergic disease now is being tied by many researchers to that the lack of of training that that's supposed to occur between you know between birth and the age three um with the microbiota turning de- turning down that that um reactive aspect of your immune response and what are some of the symptoms? Um, are there sort of early warning signs of a microbiota that's starting to be less than optimal? Uh, well, I would tend to think, obviously, my, my, my lean is, is along the gastrointestinal um, disease tract. And, and I would say that some of those symptoms like bloating, distension, um, discomfort would be signs that something is perhaps not not quite right. And particularly if, if it's you tie that in with it with the an acute onset scenario too, where and you see this there's lots in clinical practice where never been well since um, the course of antibiotics, or never well since uh, chemotherapy, or never well since uh, travelist diarrhea when they went to Bali or Mexico or something like that. And it's like okay, that's obviously caused an acute dysbiotic event um, that's had long lasting implications. And it's funny. I was uh, I was speaking at an event on um, last week, and I was talking to somebody who said that very thing to me. She said, "My partner and I went to Bali uh, last year, and I haven't been well since. I've had bloating. I've found that I'm not able to tolerate certain foods that I was able to eat. Uh, you know, I think something's happened to me." And I said, "Well, quite often, traveler's diarrhea or picking up a food yeah. poisoning event is often um, a very common precursor or." Or cause for something like SIBO to develop. Yes, yes, and 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 certainly there's that that umbrella term post infectious irritable bowel syndrome, of which some of those would have SIBO, and some of it would be chronic dysbiosis with with um, in inflamed nerves in their gut. And I think to me that's certainly where I'm thinking from is that these infectious agents or even antibiotics we know now cause long lasting gut inflammation, um, and sometimes the nerves just stay hyper. <laughs> Say inflamed, say hyperreactive to stimuli, and that's part of the problem as well. It's, it's gut integrity that that can be affected by the initial infection in that case, like travelist diarrhea, but um, then not heal up quite right because of the the um, longer lasting dysbiosis that can occur. And and we know that can get worsened when people take get travelist diarrhea, and then whilst they have it, take a course of antibiotics that increases the risk of of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome by five times or something like that. It's absolutely massive increased risk of, of long-term gut dysfunction if you take antibiotics when you have the case of traveler's diarrhea. You know, um, and sadly, that information is not, not out there either, um, which means that people inadvertently are causing themselves harm thinking they're going to help themselves. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I'm just thinking of the many times when I've uh, I've done some very big trips where I'm traveling for three plus months at a time and you'll go to the doctor to get your jabs, which you need to have in order to get access to certain countries. And they will uh, every time I've been given a box of um, antibiotics and told if you get uh, traveler's diarrhea, take these. And this was all before I knew about SIBO. Um, so I was very uneducated in the world of the, the health of the gut and what to do. And sure enough, I'd every single time I traveled to a less developed country, I would get um, some form of food poisoning or, or traveler's diarrhea. And like a dutiful patient, I would take my antibiotics. And listening to you say that that can often make it worse, I'm just thinking, oh, no wonder I've ended up in such a poor state, my poor little gut. Yeah, well, it's essentially it's adding insult on top of <laughs> a bit of another insult that's there. It's just a different sort of insult in terms of damaging the the your your bugs that are normally part of that immune response, but also seem to be worsening that that inflammation that persists afterwards. Um, yes, it would be good if that information was more widely known. I concur. Yeah, and and I know that it's, uh, a drug that's commonly used in the treatment of SIBO, which is rifaximin or rifaxin, um, depending on which brand name you're using, is often um, given as a tool for traveler's diarrhea. Yeah, and, and with rifaximin, it might be a different case. Um, and certainly the research I was looking at was just looking more generally at the category of, of antibiotics. Or as we know, 
at least from the data that we currently have in Rifaximin, it seems to be pretty selective in how it works, and it doesn't seem to have the same collateral damage issues that you have with majority of antibiotics. Plus, it seems to have sort of more of an anti-inflammatory uh, effect in the gut, whereas most antibiotics seem to have this long-lasting pro-inflammatory effect in the gut that lasts for months after the antibiotics are actually finished. And so if, if somebody does pick up uh, some uh, traveler's diarrhea, for instance, when should they be if they're going to take antibiotics, when should they be doing it? Well, um, it makes it probably quite tricky because often you're going to be in an environment where you don't have <laughs> your normal health professional who you trust, who trusted opinion to ask. So you're going to be reliant on on physicians in that that the country that you're in um, and, and their opinions on, on treatment. And they'll generally try to be on the more conservative side um, and probably prescribe them at a different point than I personally would, um, and well, personally use them, I, I perhaps would say. I mean, certainly from my perspective as a naturopath, I would recommend, and I do recommend my patients take, you know, particular herbal mixes with antimicrobial effects, but I choose my herbs that, that are going to have selective ac activity against the most common pathogens, but don't Im impact the majority of our beneficial bacteria, so it's going to have a selective influence and then i get them to take those herbs at the first sign of, of the tummy being a bit a bit strange or um after they've eaten some dodgy food and it just feels a little bit uh, not quite right as i'm sure you've experienced too rebecca I've, i'm a i've traveled heaps in southeast asia and I, I love the area but you know and i do love experimenting with food but sometimes you go to a stall and you're like oh i wish i hadn't have eaten there <laughs> that's a good time to take a dose of those herbs because they're not going to have that that sort of um the collateral damage that are associated the same with the antibiotics would. Um, and I think for most, in most situations, the, the research tells us that the, the traveler's bug, will, di diarrhea bug will clear up without any help from anything at all. Um, anyway, so, so it really comes to duration of time. Um, and that, that a lot of research tells us the antibiotics don't actually shorten the duration of the, the illness even if you do take them. Um, so I think that's the thing to keep in mind and perhaps doing a stool culture to find out exactly what's there, um, if that's possible in that time moment and you've got a short enough time window to work out what is there, can give you the clearest idea of whether it's worth treatment or not. And one thing I'd, I would like to talk about is how do we find out um, what is there? But before we do that, I'd like to talk about the why we have um, you know, less bacteria living in our small intestine versus our large intestine. So I guess that um, going back to basics of why one is one part of the GI tract is different to the other so we can understand the why and then talking about you know how we how do we even figure out who's living in there with us. Yeah, fair enough. So I think you can start even with the stomach and the reason why you know, I think we often have 10 or 100 bacteria per mil in the stomach so it's a lot less dense and most of those are travelers from your spit essentially that you swallowed um, so they come from the oral or cavity down into the stomach and it, essentially the stomach we know is a strong pH that tends to inhibit microbial growth so you just, it's just and, and it's also a quick transit time so there's not much chance for bugs to stick around um, they're being sloshed around in you know pretty strong acid environment and they move on to the small bowel and that first bit of the small bowel you know you're getting this very acidic um, gastric contents coming initially but then there's also pancreatic digestive secretions and bile from the liver that come through all three of which you see as having antimicrobial properties and the small bowel is also quite highly um, populated with with um, immune immune cells and lymphoid tissue as well which means that we're constantly producing things like um, defensins and calcinidins um, secretory IgA all of which helps maintain a certain low level of microbial um, growth in that area in addition to this digestive secretions but on top of that we have a relatively quick transit time you know between you know, food hitting your small small intestine to coming at the other end it's you know it's usually on average, about 90 minutes from from oral cavity through to, to the first bit of the colon. So that gives you an idea of how quickly things, so it might be 60 minutes or something in the small bowel, bowel lap, maybe a little bit more um, on average. And it's a motility that, that actually helps prevent overgrowth too, um, or, or, or too much growth of bacteria in that environment in addition to everything else that's going on. But that also gives you an idea that if other some of those areas are impacted, like if we take a proton pump inhibitor that stops our gastric acid, <laughs> um, then that means that, that we're losing one of those aspects to it. If we have a, 
um, vitamin D deficiency, that means we're not producing some of the calcic calcicinidins in the way that we should. That might mean we can, we're more prone to getting bacterial overgrowth or low secretory RGA could be problematic. Um, but, but it's a lack of motility, which is what most researchers are pointing out is the perhaps driver of, of overgrowth of bacteria in the, in the small bowel. Whereas in the large bowel, the transit time, you know, is usually a much longer period of time, um, which allows a greater contact between food residues and bacteria where they can, you know, proliferate and produce heaps of metabolic byproducts that are then of, of health or consequence to us. And is there an average time that generally that, that, that transit time in the large bowel occurs? Well, I usually trace it back to what we call whole gut transit time or bowel transit transit time when I'm out talking to my patients. So I'm looking from an you know, oral, when you swallow the food to when it comes to toilet bowl. So I get a mouth to toilet bowl transit. Um, and I'd say ideally you want it to be between 16 to 24 hours would be ideal. Um, so I often get patients to experiment with depending on their, their food tolerances, but you know, sesame seeds and you don't chew them well, corn on the cob, not chewed well, <laughs> sunflower seeds, for example, so you can have those things in your stool and you can see exactly where you're at. And you do find people, because sometimes people think, oh, listen, I poo once a day, therefore my transit time I'm sure is just 24 hours, but then you get them to do the test. Um, and it turns out that whilst they might be pooing once a day, it takes four days from food to go from their mouth to the toilet bowl, which is way way too long and so what what do you do you, you just uh try not to chew these items and <laughs> like how like let's say sesame yeah. seeds how much how many sesame seeds would you have to be able to then spot them in your poo um sometime later i think one or two tablespoons should be enough or, or eating a corn on the cob if that's doable too and and out of necessity you, you always not chew your corn to, to great bits and any bit that's that's left of it's mostly just straight cellulose isn't going to get broken down by you and, and very little by your by our sort of western gut microbiota so it, it will come out in the your poo pretty much intact that's so interesting and and so literally you time the the time that it goes in and then you time the time that it comes out and yes that will give you your transit time that's right yeah and, and obviously the vast majority of that will be in the colon but there, there will be individual differences there because you know some people's small bowel transit time is obviously impacted too and, and the only way of sussing that out more specifically is, is by using these you know swallowable probes in a hospital setting where they can sort of look to see when it reaches your colon specifically and the other end mm, which sounds a lot more invasive and it is yeah <laughs> yes so you usually get some, quite significant data or at least clinically useful data from doing the corn of the cob or sesame seed bowel transit test you can also use cat capsules with um, charcoal, for example, because you'll get this sort of blackness that will come out the other end too. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I, I um, often will have activated charcoal with me when I travel just to sop up anything. If I've had a meal where I feel a little bit iffy after it, I, I love charcoal. It makes it really does help uh, keep things at bay, it seems, for me anyway. And, and that is definitely something you notice, that, uh, that your poo becomes – very dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that you can use that as a marker if you can't, if you don't aren't going to go with the seeds of the corn. You know, but charcoal might be able to do it for you in the same way. Yeah, that's great. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I haven't done it for a while. I'm going to, uh, as a result of this podcast, I'm going to go and test my transit time, just see how things are going. <laughs> yeah, and it was probably different now than. I mean, if you did did yours years ago when you had more gut issues, it would probably be quite different now. I'm going to guess. Yeah, well, let's hope so. Uh, I mean, everything <laughs> feels a lot better, but, yeah. you know, I haven't done the test for a while. I'm going to go and do it. Um, so it, how do we find out what's living within our GI tract and uh, what should be there? Like, Are there certain um, groups of bacteria that we should definitely have and then those that we should be um, making sure that we don't have? Yeah. Well, I'll answer your first first part of the question first, which is how do we find out? And I'd say that up until the year 2000, we were using relatively old technology called culturing, where, you know, you get a bit of a stool sample and we play it a little bit out into a different sort of Petri dish with different media in it. And then we see what, what grew and we, and we change conditions, put some in an anaerobic chamber and some exposed to oxygen. And, and, and that was the best technology we had up until the probably late 90s. Um, and that was able to provide limited information about what was actually there because uh, – and, and limited information about the impact of what we did even. You know, I, back using the, the culturing techniques that seemed to make very little difference what food you ate and what impact it would have on your microbiota. And people were surprised at the time. They are doing these studies going, 
I reckon this should be changing your microbiota, but it's not <laughs> based on culturing techniques. But when we moved over to using um, culture independent molecular techniques where we're looking for a particular type of bacterial DNA, the 16S rRNA fragment, um, it's essentially opened up a whole new world. And the reason why everyone's excited about microbiota is because we've essentially changed technologies and can now see what's there. And some people have argued that maybe 10% of what we, what's actually in our gut we can culture in terms of 10% of the species that are there. You know, 90% of the species that are present, we couldn't, don't have, have the right skills to culture at this point in time. So, so using only culturing gives us a very incomplete idea about what's there. So since we've moved over to using molecular techniques, it's like, wow, there's actually a lot more species present and a whole bunch of bugs in large numbers that we didn't even know existed before. And I can give the idea, the, the name of, of one bug, Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, um, very important gut microbe that's usually one of the top two species in your gut and can, for some people, makes up 25% of what was there but it can't be cultured, or at least it couldn't until very recently. So we didn't even know it existed, despite the fact it made up a quarter of your poo um, until, until you know, in the last 10 or 15 years. And you're like, wow, that certainly gives you an idea of, of how far we've come. And there's a number of other species too, like Acromansia, um, that also plays a very important role in, in your health, as does Fecalobacterium, that again, we can't culture. So they don't get picked up on traditional older stool tests and the CDSA types that most um, alternative or integrative practitioners tend to use they don't if they're using culturing they won't pick up those those species nor will they tell us about the diversity of the ecosystem or the genera richness which is what the research is telling us are extremely important so we'll get quite different answers depending on what tools that we use um yeah but i think it's important that we use tools like that are based on molecular techniques to get a clearer picture of what's there a much more complete picture um yeah, and, and so fecalobacterium acromandia are two of the species that i think are are very important but less known members of the microbiota and then you've got species like bifidobacteria everyone knows bifidobacteria or lactobacilli again because these bugs have been isolated they were isolated back in the late 1800s you know so they've been around for a long time our knowledge of them has been around for a long time whereas the other bugs are less so and also a range of butyrate producing bacteria like eubacterium and roseburia that also make up decent proportion of what's in your gut generally don't get picked up with traditional culturing in any, any significant way. And what tests should uh, people who are listening be looking for or should they be asking their practitioners to conduct? Are there particular laboratories that are doing uh, these uh, tests better than others? Well, I think there's, there's different, different laboratories using different technology might be the better way of, of putting it. And there's still a number that are using the, the old culturing techniques which rely on on live bug reaching you know going from your essentially your anus to, to the lab um, to lots of different environmental conditions in, in intact they're relying on that scenario um and then they they're only able to pick up a certain percentage of what's there and and, and it can also provide some useful data too about whether potential pathogens are there or not there in, in culturing and whether those pathogens are sensitive to certain natural or synthetic antibiotics so there's still a role for that sort of aspect but you're certainly not going to get a uh comprehensive picture of what the ecosystem is actually like or what most species are actually like you know i was looking at one of my um molecular culture independent molecular test results the other day and there's you know 70 78 species that are actually picked up um and a whole range of different percentages and it gives me a much bigger picture of what's there than just looking at 12 species or 24 species um yeah um so it, I think it's a matter of perhaps working because I suppose that the, the issue at this time point is you're going to need someone to guide you through the interpretation of molecular techniques. And I'd say it's an area that that less practitioners are upskilled in compared to the, the culturing because of the, it's a new technology that's only recently become essentially available to to practitioners or the general public. Um, yeah, but it's certainly you would need professional advice to interpret it and, and walk through it, in my opinion. Um, and understand what it's actually meaning. Mm. And if we think about uh, what sh we should be seeing, are there particular strains or species that, uh, you know, just categorically, we, we should have these and, and we should be looking for them in our samples? Yeah, well, I, I would go with Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, Acromansia and Bucinophila and, and Bifidobacteria and some ro and some butyrate producing bugs like Roseburia, um, subdolo, subdolo granulum, anaerostipes. 
et cetera, um, which are probably very foreign terms for, for a lot of people because, because they're important bugs that are recently discovered. So it just, again, it, you know, all those no bifidobacteria, all those no bacteroides or E. coli, you know, even though, e, you know, E. coli makes up, you know, 0.01% of what's actually in your colon. It's actually a really small player, but we discovered it, you know, 1885 or something like that. So it's been around and people are familiar with it for a very long period of time whereas acromanzia mucinophila makes up it's probably 30 times the population of what what e coli is but it's only been recently discovered so most of us don't know that it actually exists let alone the important role it plays in 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 gut integrity um keeping your metab- metabolism functioning functioning properly um and, and even it seems to be very uh, – people that have high levels of acromanzia, for example, tend to respond to weight loss interventions better compared to those who have low, low levels, just give you an idea of, of the research that's come out in acromanzia in the last five years or so. And talking about weight loss, it is something that uh, people with SIBO seem to fall into one of two categories. Uh, they're either very underweight and losing weight rapidly or they're in the category I fell into, which was gaining weight despite eating incredibly healthily and unable to then lose the weight um, once gained. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is not uncommon. And we know now that the the importance of the microbiota with with body metabolism and, and weight issues. And there's a very amazing study done by uh, Turnbaugh and colleagues, I think in 2006, where they had, you know, these, these sort of germ-free um, mice that were, you know, really thin, metabolically really healthy, and they actually just introduced some poo from an obese obese mouse, and then that that mouse model be, they became obese despite no change in caloric intake, no change in caloric output. You know, so they weren't exercising more or less, and they weren't eating more, but they gained huge amounts of weight and became obese and we had had type 2 diabetes and a whole range of things all from just getting a fecal transplant from an obese mouse you know so we know that actually the ecosystem of the gut is hugely important with with in terms of the role it plays with the metabolism and we're still teasing out you know all the nuances there um but there are certain species like acromanzia fecalobacterium and bifidobacteria that do seem to play protective roles so those would be things that you'd certainly wanting to be looked at um on a, on a stool test if if you're wanting to look at uh, potential microbiota relationships to troubles with with shifting weight for example mm, yeah definitely that's something now that i've got through my SIBO treatment and uh the SIBO um to this point in time, uh, thankfully, has not returned. It's I now look at these other things of going. Okay, clearly there are still things going wrong. Um, so let's let's look at next steps. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose it's, it's there's multiple things because you can have SIBO and colonic dysbiosis, or even treatment of SIBO can actually worsen colonic dysbiosis too. Um, so yeah, yeah. So it, it, I think for a lot of people, it should be looked at as a post SIBO treatment mm. <laughs> or during SIBO treatment, but certainly should be should be considered too about what impact have we had on the colonic microbiota and how is that impacting the rest of our health. And it's interesting you say that, Jason, around how SIBO treatment can often have a negative impact because I do hear from quite a lot of people saying, uh, you know, I, I had SIBO and my symptoms were not great, but they were bearable. I've gone through treatment and now I'm so much worse. How is this possible? Why am I sicker than before? Um, can you talk through how that can occur with people with SIBO when they're, yeah. they're making things worse? I've seen that happen too, sadly, um, in terms of patients that have come to me before and they're like actually worse after treatment than what they were before. And I think that it depends a bit on, on, on the treatments that we know that some like antibiotics do cause collateral damage to, I mean, to the, the clonic ecosystem and, and gut inflammation, which can actually worsen um, situations like visceral hypersensitivity. And I think um, some of your your, your um, listeners will be familiar with the concept of visceral hypersensitivity, some may not, but essentially it means the nerves in your gut are hypersensitive. And we know this can happen with antibiotics. We can It happens with traveler's diarrhea, um, for example, but, but and a few other 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 things like high, high periods of stress can actually worsen that too. But but it's not unusual for, you know, a course of antibiotics to flare that up, which means that people become less tolerant to to colonic gas production than what they were before. 
so they become you know over I mean, the sebum might have been dealt with now but they're actually more reactive to to um, gas forming foods because their their nerves and their colon are now hyper responsive to to gas and I think that can be part of it um, and so sometimes the dysbiosis caused by some types of, of antimicrobial treatments um, can be can cause an overgrowth of gram negative um, proteobacteria they tend to, to respond well with overgrowth to some types of antibiotics. Gram-negative bacteria contain lipopolysaccharides, also known as endotoxins, and endotoxins actually cause leaky gut, but they also cause systemic inflammation and visceral hypersensitivity. You know, so, so that can be secondary. You know, antibiotics can cause the inflammation, but they can also cause the um, increase of, of lipopolysaccharide-containing bacteria in the gut, but so can dietary changes that people actually can so, sometimes implement too. So if you put on if you're, or if you go on to a high fat, low fiber diet, for example, um, we know that encourages the the growth of um, gram negative endotoxin rich bacteria, but also the absorption of those endotoxins, which then can cause a whole, you know, have been linked to to obesity and type two diabetes and depression, for example. Two, just give you a small small picture of the, of the endotoxin research, and as a whole theme of people who are really interested in looking at, at the, this concept of metabolic endotoxemia. And it hasn't reached in any degree of, of um, fervor the, the blogosphere, but it is certainly a lot of excitement in, in the research worlds because um, it certainly links in the chain, like dietary, Western type dietary changes or or different types of diet that are essentially low in fiber and, and negative alterations to the gut ecosystem. And, and on top of that, increased with uh, growth of lipopolysaccharide containing bacteria, you tend to have a decreased concentration of butyrate producing bacteria too. And butyrate is an anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acid that decreases inflammation in the gut. It promotes healing of gut cells, both colon and small intestinal cells. It decreases inflammation of the nerves in the gut, so it actually helps deal with visceral hypersensitivity, improves insulin sensitivity, improves mitochondrial function. There's a whole bunch of wonderful things that, that butyrate actually does, including improving the blood-brain barrier um, in terms of its integrity. But we know that certain dietary types like high-protein, low-carb, low-fiber, high-fat, um, low fiber diets will it decrease levels of butyrate producing bugs in the gut and decrease butyrate production that has other impact over the longer term too. So I think that sometimes the dietary approaches that, that people follow can sadly have a negative consequence on, on colonic microbiota. That's fascinating. And, and I'm just thinking of all of the various diets that even I myself have followed. And I think of the ketogenic diet, which is very much high fat, low um, and protein and, and, and uh, low f- carbohydrate, low fiber. Even many of the SIBO diets that people follow are very much in that realm. Um, what, what do you do when you're working with um, people with SIBO in terms of their dietary the dietary guidelines and because diet is something that is so it is such a topic of uh, emotion and passion for people because it is something that they feel yeah. that they can control and also generally people can see that they'll eat something and they have an immediate reaction to it so there's they can I think for many people they feel that they've they're very linked in with nutrition or diet and um and how they're feeling. So they want to be very much in control of that. Um, what do you do with your patients around what they eat when, when you're treating them with SIBO? Okay. I mean, I, I would say that probably in, in the spectrum of practitioners, I would be one of the least restrictive <laughs> diets or pre- prescriber of diets. Um, I'm pretty, I think because of my research doing my PhD and, and all that year of research, those years of research looking at the wonders of the of the clotic microbiota and the clonic ecosystem, I'm pretty hesitant to to use any intervention that's going to significantly harm that ecosystem unless it's really needed, like you know, antibiotics save lives, they save limbs, you know, like there's times where they're <laughs> by far the most needed intervention. And and even with, with dietary things too, there can be times for more extreme dietary, um, what I would perhaps call more extreme dietary approaches that have collateral impacts on the on the ecosystem, but I'm pretty loath to use them, um, at least if at all, or at least not for the first long while of treatment. Um, and probably the the most extreme I would go, which is probably not that extreme, is a low FODMAP diet. Um, and when I do testing for SIBO, I always I generally test for three sugars. I do glucose, fructose, and lactulose, and we get an idea 
whether people are actually reacting to fructose or not from that because you'll be surprised a number of times where people actually don't actually um this is, for fructose isn't actually feeding their SIBO bugs for example whereas other times it is so that can help give you a bit more fine tuning with with dietary um suggestions and and and, and fine-tune the restrictions that, that you're actually implementing dietary-wise. Um, but I'm also aware that a low FODMAP diet, we know, decreases levels of Fecalobacterium, Acromandia, Bifidobacteria, Lactobacilli um, o- over time, too, is what the research is suggesting, too. So I'm aware that, you know, if the short term, that's not such a big concern, i.e. just for like six weeks, or I use prebiotics um, or selective prebiotics to actually help offset that because I know that that those species are going to be whacked around by this diet. I'm going to supplement with with specific fibers that are generally well tolerated that feed those specific bacterial species that are that are knocked around by a low FODMAP diet, for example. And you could do a similar thing with the ketogenic type diet, um, although you might, it might <laughs> it might take a bit more work at working around. I mean, there's a so an animal study just published. Um, a few months back that described the ketogenic diet as, as an antimicrobial treatment um, for, for, gut, for gut dysbiosis because it had such a huge impact on the ecosystem. I thought that's you know, not necessarily a positive thing for, for a lot of patients. Mm, that's that's so interesting. And, and I'm thinking of the people that I uh, have contact with who will often say to me, I've been following this diet for three years, five years, uh, you know, long, long periods of time. And, and I do, uh, I've often thought, gosh, what impact long term are we having on our, on the health of our gut? Yes. And the the species living within it by restricting our foods. And and I hear also from many people who are down to five foods. They're eating chicken, some carrots, uh, maybe some some plain white rice, and they and that's all that they're doing. And so in for those people that are that perhaps have been on something long term or are right back to a, just a handful of foods, what's your advice on how to start to experience expand the the um the diet that they're they're following and obviously what can they do to assess the health of their gut yeah i mean i think cases like that are are a perfect time to to use a molecular stool analysis to to see what's actually there and i wouldn't recommend uh an old-fashioned culture because they're not going to be sent enough to pick up what we're actually looking for, nor will they even look at the species that we're particularly keen on like acromanzi and fecalobacterium as as main ones um so I think that would be prime time to look at that and then you could see what the ecosystem is like and then how look at tools that we know can adjust that. Now the challenge is is if I have a patient that can can take the prebiotics I recommend and implement the dietary changes I recommend, within two months you can make massive shifts to one ecosystem in terms of improved um richness, improved diversity, improved levels of beneficial bugs and lower levels of pathobionts. And pathobionts are bugs that, ah, they're okay to have around, they do some good things for us, but in the wrong amounts, they actually cause us harm. Um, yeah, but the challenge is is if, if we're working with patients who can't implement a lot of those things, then it's, it's much slower going and and you're it's really trying to go work with, with them on a one-on-one basis of going, okay, well, your fecalobacterium is low, I would normally give this this and this prebiotic, but chances are you're gonna you're gonna bloat to hyphen <laughs> or have diarrhea when you take those or feel just absolutely rotten. Um, so it, it's much slower progress, um, and it's trying to work out what tools work with that individual patient, whilst perhaps seeing if we can we can work on the underlying reason why they're 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 so being so reactive to to foods too. Because I think there's you're right that the longer they're on diets like that, the more chances there are there are of of actual species lost in the gut ecosystem. And and you know we know from mouse models, which is the best re- data we have at this point in time, that if we starve them of fiber for long enough, that ecosystem certain species it could go extinct. You know, and then we can introduce fiber back in. It doesn't matter. You, the species are gone. Now, how long it takes for humans to starve out species, we've got no idea. Really, it could be a year, it could be two years, it could be five years, it could be ten years. We don't know. Um, but certainly doing testing like like with molecular techniques that actually will tell you the number of species that are present as well, we get an idea of what your diversity score is like. And I certainly have seen people who were on more, you know, at the extreme end of, of SIBO treatments, both in terms of antibiotics and herbal antimicrobials for, you know, a 12-month period and very restricted diet. I've seen their, their, their sort of stool tests afterwards and their diversity 
is very low. The levels of beneficial bugs is very low, and the pro-inflammatory bugs are actually quite high. You know, because some of the foods that we're we're eating in those diets, like like higher protein or higher fat, inadvertently feed a bunch of pro-inflammatory species in our gut that don't you don't get overt obvious symptoms. You don't get the bloating, distension, etc. But you are getting the metabolic byproducts that are not healthy for you long term and can worsen things like visceral hypersensitivity, for example. Mm. And and so you've said that. Uh- Whilst studies aren't, uh, we don't have a clear definitive answer on how long does it take to see the extinction of these species. Do you personally have a a time frame that you would prefer not to go over when it comes to uh, having a patient follow a restricted diet? Well, yeah, <laughs> and I might have my 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 aim of of you know three months or something like that of of before we start introducing back things things back in and that really depends on how severe people's symptoms symptoms are and how severe their gut is when I, when I get to see them earlier on in the piece it's usually much easier um to get you know um those fodmap foods back back in after three months of treatment and a lot more after six months that's pretty consistent but when people are you know when i see those people that have been you know treated for the last 10 years with with a whole range of different things and they're down to five foods it's much harder going um but i do try to to get them to at least take some of the prebiotics that tend to be well tolerated by that group um as a way of of um and i do that with my patients even when i put them on a low fodmap diet for a period of time to to offset any potential harmful effects that can occur with such a diet We've talked a little bit about pre and probiotics, so let's let's just dive into them now. And if you can start off by explaining what are pre and probiotics, just for for any listeners that uh, don't know much about them. Okay, well, probiotics are live microorganisms which, when consumed, have a health benefit to the host. I think it's a very simple definition. I think that's a definition that the World Health Organization uses. And prebiotics are selectively fermented tend to be fibers that that increase levels of certain bacterial species, again, to benefit host health. And I think that most people have some idea what, about probiotics in terms of what they are, but the term prebiotic is, is over casually used, and people refer to all sort of dietary fibers as, as prebiotics, which they don't actually meet the definition of selectivity um, that you can actually get with, with prebiotics. Like if I have a patient with uh, – who shows on a stool test with low fecalibacterium and low bifidobacteria, I can give them lactulose and it will increase fecalibacterium and bifidobacteria, you know, pretty, pretty consistently. And it's like, ah, you know, so it's having very, and the research tells us that too, they have, have fairly select, selective effects, at least in the shorter term, and long term, they tend to improve overall diversity in a very beneficial way. Mm. And so do people need to, would you, would the first step be to determine what is in their gut uh, through a, a um, through analysis before prescribing what pre and probiotics that they should be taking? Um, you, you obviously have a chance to be more specific and more targeted in your approach um, when you know exactly what's there, what percentages they are, and how we can, you know, what tools we can use to then modify that. Um, but I don't, and I think it depends on, on the background of the person. Then, you know, the average Joe Blow off the street or, or, Jane, Jane Blow in this case, it most likely be women who will be interested in this sort of information and actually making their, their relevant dietary changes, et cetera. Um, then I think it's actually quite fun to, to, I mean, if with the, with the, I think I suppose it depends because I'm going around in circles a bit here, but the prices, the price of and costings of these tests have actually come down considerably, at least for the, the microbiota molecular techniques that are can be around, you know under under $150 to find out exactly what's there. So that makes it actually much more achievable to to assess where you're at now and also do follow up to see how things have changed back in, when you're paying, you know, 4 or 500 or 700 dollars for a stool test it made it much more challenging to for people that weren't, you know, had a lot going on with them to even pay for the tests um and two, follow-up testing was, you know, much more challenging to deal with. Whereas with the molecular techniques being a much more cost-effective way of of seeing what's going on, then it can be a useful tool for even just the average person who's interested in their health to do, um, and then get a chance to see what's there. But people that don't have issues with their health can obviously, um, or have, I should say, don't have SIBO and irritable bowel syndrome can often play around with with prebiotic supplements to to their heart's content with, with no no real risk of, of symptom flare-ups which you're probably going to get so most people who are listening to this I'm going to guess have got 
you know, SIBO from what you're saying or, or irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms. And you've got to be a bit more cautious with, with prebiotics because some of them are more prone to causing gas than others. So you, you have to tailor things a bit more specifically for, for your guts. So that, therefore it can be useful to see what's there beforehand as well. Mm. And and that's something that I hear from people that saying that they're um, they're trying pre and probiotics and then they're having flares and it's making them feel worse. And what should they do? Um, and so I, my question is, at what point should we we be looking at pre and probiotics in our um, treatment of SIBO? Should we be doing it at the beginning, in the middle stages, once we've cleared the SIBO? What? How do you approach it? Ah, uh, well, my approach will probably be different from from many others, but I use probiotics. From de- from day one, <laughs> and I tend to use prebiotics from from day one too, um, but it, it it's very individualized as well. You know that we know there's a couple of prebiotics that tend to be well tolerated and not increase gas related symptoms, and can actually decrease gas related symptoms and bloating and distension scores and improve bowel hat- pattern, for example, or decrease methane production and methane producers. So I will use those as my primary tools. And there's there's a prebiotic like lactulose, which is I'm going to be much more selective with because depending on what the test breath test results come back and tell me, because it can work as a prokinetic agent, which is great. I like using prokinetics that also enhance the health of the colonic ecosystem. That also helps heal up a damaged gut. Um, so in the right person, lactulose can can be a wonderful therapeutic tool. But in the wrong patient or the, or the patient that's not matched with well, it'll it'll worsen a lot of their symptoms. You know. Um, so it has to be, be a bit more tailored. So, so for me, I definitely use probiotics and prebiotics initially um, as part of treatment. And I use my, my probiotics very selectively too in that um, for, for desired aim. So, you know, so if I have someone who's in you know, constipation type IBS or methane predominant SIBO um, who've got very slow gut transit time, which is what we find out from doing that corn or sesame seed test, then I'll use a probiotic that speeds up gut transit time. Not, not all of them do that, but uh, there's a handful of strains that do do that. So I'll use those ones. And sometimes just that simple thing will make a massive, massive difference to that person's state of health. Um, So I think when probiotics are chosen well to match the patient and their their health condition, um, the chances of of having flare-ups or worsening symptoms are dramatically reduced. They still occasionally happen with very sensitive patients, but they're, they're, most of my patients actually tolerate both the pre and probiotics that I recommend. And it, it starts getting more complicated when you get to the, those patients that you mentioned before who are eating five foods and have been unwell for a long time. Um, we sometimes have to work, you know, it's a bit more touch and go with some of those, those agents, but the majority of my, my SIBO patients or IBS patients would tolerate the right probiotic and the right prebiotic without issues. Do you recommend that people um, go and try uh, pre and probiotics on their own or should they be working with a practitioner to uh, tailor the, the treatment? Yeah, I, I would actually say that, that if you want to get the most out of taking probiotics, work with a practitioner that understands how to use them and what I would perhaps say appropriately in terms of matching the, the actions of the specific probiotic strain to the condition that you're trying to treat. And I think that's the key thing. Um, I think there's this, sometimes this idea out there that just, uh, I don't know, that a probiotic is just like a placeholder or that they have this whole range of, of actions and actually one therapeutic strain might have a couple of different actions there. Like I mentioned that one strain that actually speeds up your, your colon transit time. Now, if you took that strain inadvertently when you have a diarrhea type IBS patient or diarrhea SIBO patient, is that going to be helpful to speeding up your gut transit time? Obviously not. You know, so I think, and if you don't know that and you're just random bu- buying random products off the shelf, then I think that can be problematic. And there's a greater chance of, of choosing one that one the strain doesn't actually match your indication well at all or could exacerbate your, your scenario. And, and two, we know from market basket surveys done around the world, although none have been done in Australia specifically, but around the world, that, that some su- supplements don't contain the strains that they're even supposed to contain. And there's perhaps differences within brands. So if you're going with getting expertise from someone who's, who's got the training, they might be able to, to, to point you to the products that use well-researched, well-characterized strains that are far, and the companies that, that use those strains are far less likely to have um, contaminants, for example, or, and, and actually meet their label claims. That's what we do know from research around the world. What's your advice to people, and sadly there are many out there that are, just don't have a practitioner in their local area that knows anything about SIBO or, or knows much about things like pre and probiotics. Do you have any advice on what these people can do in terms of if they're really eager to, to, 
to try and use a pre and probiotic on on how they can approach taking something? That's a good question, um, and I would still think trying to make contact with with practitioners who do have that that knowledge would be the good first step, and that might mean doing Skype consults or phone consults or traveling for the consult. Um, sadly, um, to, to actually find the people with the right background and right knowledge to help guide you through that. Because as, as I'm sure you've said many times is that, you know, SIBO is a relatively new diagnosis. You know, it wasn't part of my naturopathic training in the late nineties that this condition even really existed bar in people that had, you know, part of the small bowel removed. That was all we knew about SIBO up until the early two thousands, essentially. So there'll be a lot of people that just, it wasn't part of their training or they've heard little tidbits of it. So I think you're better off trying to find people that have the expertise to to help you through what what you're going through and who have the knowledge to know what you're going through. It's interesting you say that. I had a, a an email from somebody just very recently at her wits end and I just wanted to reach through the email and give her a big hug. Uh, she's based in the UK and she was told in writing by her doctor that SIBO does not exist. It is not a recognised medical condition and therefore she will not be treated for it and the poor thing I just felt for her because yeah. uh, you know we know it's a real thing um, and d- like, do you have any advice for people that perhaps are facing those kind of challenges where they've got practitioners who are saying it does not exist you know, this is not a known condition um, on on how they can just get through to uh, through that that phase and finding someone that can care for them well, I'd, I'd say contacting someone like you, <laughs> and it's probably the support group that might come with with a healthy gut would probably help that. Um, so you realise that you're not necessarily alone. Um, and it's funny you say that story, and it reminds me, um, or it's not funny, it's probably sad, but it reminds me of what, what was going on when I was doing my my irritable bowel syndrome research back in in 2000. Of you know, I interviewed you know probably a couple hundred people with IBS as part of my research, and the number of people that said that their doctors told them it wasn't real, it was all in their head, was still <laughs> quite significant, um, and that had improved dramatically over the last sort of 10 years. And you think, okay, well, SIBO is probably at that point now too. Like give it another 10 years and this will be far less of a, of a it won't happen nearly as often as what it still is. Um, so so the first step is trying to find a, perhaps a community that uh, someone can actually can relate to what's going on for you. And secondly, it's trying to find a practitioner who's got the requisite ex- expertise and training to to be able to help you um, work through and listen to you too. I mean, this the fact that if you can speak to someone who actually listens and has an understanding of what's going on for you, that makes a huge difference to people. It really does. And and when they have practitioners who don't do that and say, oh, no, it's all in your head, it's not real, it's, it's a horrible experience. Mm. And you you, uh, you know my gorgeous naturopath, Natalie, and one of the very first things she said to me when I walked through her door and burst into tears and just said, I don't know what's wrong, I, I'm sick and I, I'm sick of being, uh, of no one believing me. And one of the first things she said was, I believe you and we'll get to the bottom of this. And that in itself was just so comforting and it gave yeah. me the emotional permission to believe in myself and to think that I wasn't going mad because I'd had multiple uh, doctors say to me that there was nothing wrong because it didn't show up on a blood test. Um, and so I think the emotional support that comes with finding people, uh, you know, like, you know, what we have with the healthy gut and uh, there are plenty of other platforms out there where you can find people that know about SIBO and can be there emotionally for you is, is really powerful powerful as a really powerful support to the recovery of of this condition agreed yes. yeah um one of my last questions is if somebody is just using pre and probiotics let's say they're because i do see this a lot with people that they've gone and bought some supplements or pre and probiotics they're just giving them a shot because they're <laughs> They're desperate to try and find something yeah. that works, and it's causing a big flare. Um, what's your advice on what to do if they're if they're really flaring up from it? Well, I mean, the first thing I think is is cessation, <laughs> cessation of use. So stop stop using it and um, see how things respond from from that time point. Um, you know that happens as a as a clinician who's been in practice for seventeen years too. That you'll get people that react to a whole range of things that ninety. Five percent people don't react to as well, but the first thing you do is get them to stop taking what they they are, and then you're trying to look for 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 causes. Is that the only thing that's changed? Is that the only thing you've introduced at that that time point? And again, they might want to get more advice from someone who might have more expertise in that situation too. Of going, okay, well, was that the right thing for me? You know, as I said, if they happen to take a probiotic that speeds up colon transit time and gut transit time when they've got diarrhea, then that's not going to be a a wise thing. And there's probably not not an easy 
way of determining that from just like blogging or looking at blogs or looking at um you know, websites, for example, because the information on, on probiotic labels won't necessarily be specific to help you with that either, for that matter. So you can't necessarily trust that information on labels, which tends to be pretty generic rather than specific to the research done on that strain contained in that supplement. Mm, yeah. And I, I, I know that my listeners will be wanting, uh, you know, a full list of every pre and probiotic that they should take. <laughs> but I think that the important thing that you've mentioned here is to really work with a, a qualified and experienced practitioner that can work with your individual scenario rather than, than us giving a list of pre and probiotics that people then may take, which may inadvertently make uh, not be the right ones for them. I think with, with probiotics, that's definitely the case. And even in the, the broader category of prebiotics, there are going to be some that, that are not going to be helpful and some that are helpful to the majority of people, but still but they might be more helpful for methane type SIBO. So I still think you'll get the best out of your experimentation if you <laughs> don't experiment so much and can get advice and feedback from, from people that have guided others through it, ideally. Yeah. Yeah. And in, and just in terms of how they come, should we be having our pre and probiotics in foods, things like, um, like you said, fibrous foods or things like sauerkraut or uh, kimchi or, you know, those other fermented foods or cultured yogurt that you make yourself? Or should we be having these in, um, you know, capsule form or powdered form? What's the best way of, of actually taking them? That's a big question. <laughs> I, think, I think it depends on what you're trying to do too. And that if you're just, again, a person with nothing to see wrong with you, um, who just wants to, t t to have some sort of probiotic as a daily thing, then I think it makes sense as having, having probiotic foods, you know, um, like that you can make yourself because wild ferments are exactly that they're wild you know i buy kimchi or or sauerkraut daily not because i think it's going to have any specific targeted benefit but just by having some of that you know those microbes tend to improve my immune response for example you know so you get some benefit from having any sort of fermented food um but if you're after a specific targeted action then i think you're better off using using probiotic strains that have research showing that they're useful for that action. And I think that's clear because you can have a whole range of studies being done showing that the probiotic A, B, and C don't work for this condition, but probiotic D does. So, you know, and that, and sometimes you can have variation even within the same species that you've got different strains that will work. You know, there's lactobacillus rhamnosus GG doesn't prevent urinary tract infections, but lactobacillus rhamnosus GR1 does. <laughs> You know, just small differences in genes turned off or on can dictate whether the strain is helpful or not for treating a specific condition. So when it comes to treating conditions, I think you should be using well-characterized, well-researched probiotic supplements. But if you're after just general health improvements, then I think having probiotic-rich foods or microbe-rich foods might be a bit more accurate way of describing it is, is a great approach. Um, and same with, with prebiotics that, you know, if you, if you choose your foods really well, Assuming you've got a, a broad range of dietary options that that you can you can withstand, then obviously you have been having onions and garlic and you know true tomato chokes and yakon tubers and a few other things that are high in in fruitans and having legumes, for example, can actually make a huge difference for feeding up members of your microbiota that 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 are are health promoting. Um, but it becomes more problematic if you if you react to those. Those things. So, so for me, I, I, I tend not to take. I certainly don't take a probiotic supplement daily, but I eat fermented foods daily, um, and I would eat prebiotic-rich foods daily um, as a, as a general thing. And foods high in resistant starch, for example, to try to make sure that a wide spectrum of my bugs are well fed. Um, but if my little girl comes back from daycare with rotavirus and vomiting and diarrhea, I'm going to take the probiotic strain Albuminosis GG that's got clinical trials showing that it that prevents rotaviral diarrhea and or short duration by two days and give it to her to for that matter not not play around with sauerkraut which may or may not contain a strain that has an impact on rotavirus whereas i know that genetically unique strain has got the actions that i'm after to to both bind to rotavirus enhance secretory iga production both of which shorten the duration of the, of the disease significantly mm, mm, yeah and i think that's i think that's great advice really being uh targeted uh for the specific actions or outcomes that you want uh and then having you know things like fermented foods or um you know, like sauerkraut or kimchi or kefir or whatever, uh, is part of just kind of general health. If you're yes. if you're in a place where you can be tolerating that, which many of my listeners are not yet, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're and on their journey. And when you start looking at at the microbiota, those it's 
it's the fermentable foods and prebiotics that really shift the microbiota in terms of diversity, in terms of um, richness, in terms of increasing levels of bacteria dramatically. You don't get that from fermented foods and from probiotic supplements. You do get it from prebiotics and dietary changes. Um, but yeah, and that's that's the interesting thing is when you start using molecular techniques to assess microbiota and seeing what's there and then seeing what shifts as you can see massive shifts when people can can use those tools and you also see the lack of effect of of, of just having some fermented food daily because that doesn't impact your levels of anaerostipes or blotia <laughs> or subdolar granulum for example because they're not in that fermented food and they're not eating anything from that fermented food but they do eat resistant starches and prebiotic like compounds in legumes and onions and garlic for example yeah yeah, yeah, wonderful. And really, I think the takeaway is that it's uh, it's a process. Um, so even the, the the people that are on five foods and they're they're quite unwell, it's a it's a process to return back uh, to health. It may not be a quick fix. It may be a, a longer term journey, but that it's about you know taking the appropriate steps doing the appropriate testing to understand what is going on within your system specifically for you uh, and and uh, tailoring a, an approach that's unique to your unique needs at that point in your journey because your journey will change depending on where you are in your treatment and your recovery as well. Well said. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Thank you. I've been listening. <laughs> Dr. Jason Horolek, it's been an absolute joy to have you on the Healthy Gut podcast today. Now, I know you are an incredibly busy man. Uh, is there any way that people can reach out and connect with you if they would like to, uh, to know more or perhaps even be treated by you? Um, I do practice at Gould's Natural Medicine in Hobart is my, my clinical practice base. Um, and I do see patients via Skype and phone, um, although I believe there's a bit of a waiting list currently. Um, and I do have some basic information on probiotics and advanced information on probiotics on my website called theprobioticadvisor.com. And the, the surgical database is a you can have a 24-hour trial and have a bit of a play around, but, but you'll probably find some of the information in the freely available lectures on there of, of interest in terms of some of the, the background of, some of the probiotics type information we've been talking about today. Um, and I suppose maybe keep an ear out if you sign up for my newsletter on Probiotic Advisor. Um, and to be honest, I've been very slack and probably put up one newsletter in the last couple of years. So don't worry if you don't get one soon. I won't bombard you with email junk, I can assure you. But I'm going to try to organize um, some webinars for meeting your I run these workshops on meeting your microbiome locally in Hobart, and I'm trying to convert those workshops through to online settings. So I work with groups to, have, you know, in a group setting to interpret people's um, microbiota results, for example. And we look at the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of one's ecosystem and how we can change that. So um, if you're on that, that email list, then I'll be able to keep you informed when I eventually develop this into an online platform. Wonderful. And I've got all of those links in the show notes. So that anyone listening uh, can just uh, go to the show notes and click those links. Uh, Jason, it's been uh, great having you on the show today. I know I've learned lots and I'm sure my listeners have too. So thanks so much for coming on the Healthy Gut Podcast. Oh, you're very welcome um, to chatting about gut probiotics, prebiotics. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. So um, thanks. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Jason Horolek as much as I did. I know I have learned so much and he's just an absolute joy to have on the show. If you would like to receive the full transcription or the show notes um, from today's show or any links that were mentioned, simply head to thehealthygut.co forward slash Jason. And if you know anybody that might benefit from listening to this podcast, don't forget to share it with them. And I absolutely love hearing your feedback. So do write us a rating and review in iTunes or the app you use to listen to this podcast. Not only do I love to hear your feedback, but it does really help other people know that this is the right kind of podcast for them when it comes to learning more about gut health. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Twitter and Google+. Just look for us under The Healthy Gut. 
Coming up on next week's show, we're joined by Larry and Belinda Wern from Clear Passage Therapies, and we talk all about adhesions. And I had a real light bulb moment when it came to understanding or even hearing about adhesions last year and realising that they could have been a missing link in understanding what had been going wrong in my abdominal cavity for so long. So I look forward to sharing that episode with you next week. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. And as we are fully funding this podcast, if you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast so that we can continue to bring you future episodes, all you need to do is make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Belinda Coombs for the production, editing and original music score of this podcast. To hear more of Belinda's music, head to soundcloud.com forward slash Belinda Coombs. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.